today the world well those who are awakened in the world are looking on in fear because we know that a great catastrophe is on the horizon many are looking at what's going on between north korea and america we are hearing the talk of war the rumors of war and we know that if world war three as it's dubbed was to break out it will be a catastrophe because we're not talking about back in the day where they used to fight with bow and arrow or through guns but we are talking about nations now having the weapons to totally annihilate another country another nation where millions and millions of lives can be lost it will be an absolute catastrophe and many are looking on in fear knowing sooner or later it's all about to kick off and many are worried about this world war three that is soon to break loose upon this world guaranteed but i want to talk to you all about another war which is also dubbed as world war three which we are currently under and i'll speak about that in a moment we are also in a war but funny enough about this war many people don't realize it but this war is actually more serious that's what's going on between America and North Korea. And this war is between the King of the North and the King of the South. Now, who is the King of the North and who is the King of the South? Some of you may wonder. Well, we have to go to our Bible, which has the answer to everything. In Psalms 48, Psalms 48, verse one and two, we are told, a song and psalm for the sons of Korah Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised is the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. So it's talking about the Lord, the great God of heaven. It continues, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So where does the God of heaven dwell? He dwells in the sides of the north, high above the heavens. Now, what about this king of the south I am talking about? Well, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 15, this is talking about Lucifer here, Satan. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 15, we are told, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So where is Lucifer? He has fallen from heaven. And if you fall down from heaven, where are you going? You are going down south. So it tells us, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So what was Lucifer's problem? He had an ego problem. He wants to be like God. I, I, I. He wants to ascend to the north where God dwelt. And because he coveted this position, because he desired to be God, remember the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He transgressed God's law and he wasn't repentant. He was cast down to the earth, where he became the king of the south, the god of this world, the prince of this world, as the Bible describes. Again, talking about the fall of Lucifer, we are told in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 to 9, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the world, the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels cast out with him. So I'm sure you're getting the picture, it's pretty clear. Satan, who was Lucifer at that time, was in heaven. He wanted to be like God. There was war in heaven, the first ever war to ever take place in the universe. There was war in heaven, so he was cast down to the earth. But this warfare, this great controversy didn't stop there. It has now continued upon this earth. 
Before time, they were fighting for their heavenly temple. Today, they are fighting for the spiritual temple, the body temple, that temple being you and I. For we are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? So who are the temple of God? Are we not a temple of God? And if you're a temple, what happens? It means you are a dwelling place for something. And what is this thing? Oh, I shouldn't say thing. And what is it that's supposed to dwell in us? It continues. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So we are a temple of God and God desires to dwell in that temple, in us. And he has every right to because he created us. So we are supposed to be a dwelling place for God. Just as he dwells high in the north, he also through the spirit, through the spirit has the ability to dwell in us. So we are one with him. That's the object of the gospel, Christ in you the hope of all glory we are to be a dwelling place for God we are the temple of God and the Bible goes over this over and over again because he wants us the Lord wants us to fully understand this that we are not our own we are an habitation for something and that could either be the God or it can either be the king of the self Satan you'll find again speaking about how God wants to dwell in us we are told in Isaiah chapter 57 verse 15 for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. That's the king of the north we saw. But it continues with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Again, 1 John 4, 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit. So how does it happen? It's through the spirit, which we can't see because the Lord tells us the spirit cometh like the wind. Can you see the wind? No, you can't. It's spiritual, but he can dwell in us through faith if we desire it. Again, speaking about this, the Lord tells us, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. So it's not just the Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, but it's also Christ. And with Christ comes the Father, because the Father's in him. So is the Spirit, they are one. So it becomes a kingdom. That's why the Lord says, the kingdom of God is in you. You know, ye are bought as a price. So in us dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Bible says, in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Christ was the Spirit and the Father. And they want to come and take their abode with us. That's the gospel. That's why Christ says, I in, I in them and we in him. We become one with God. That's what he so desires. But many of us don't understand it. Many of us are like the Pharisees because we have our minds so fixed on this earthly kingdom and this earthly war that's going on. Whereas we're missing the focus of what really is important and that is the true kingdom which we are to be a part of when we become born again we become born again believe it or not you give up your rights as a citizen on this earth we become pilgrims like Abraham was we become ambassadors as Paul talks about so if you're an ambassador from God you're just passing through. You don't get involved in the political arena of that country. Like an ambassador from America to Europe, for example, doesn't get involved in political affairs. What's the object of the ambassador? It's simply to protect the rights of the citizenship that are temporarily in that country. So, for example, if the government starts to make law that infringe upon my rights in terms of religion, then we protest, Protestants. But if they're not doing things which affect my relationship with God, then we stay out of it. It's none of our business. But many of us like to get too involved in politics. 
And when we do that, we do disjustice to God because Christ never got involved in that. When I tried to draw him into earthly matters, he didn't care. That wasn't his problem. His more effect was the spiritual kingdom, which he wanted to get people to be a part of, and not this earthly kingdom. But the Pharisees missed it. They were too focused on Rome. You know what was going on? They wanted to be free from Rome. When Christ was trying to talk about the greatest bondage that they were in, which we have all been in, and that is sin. And that's what he wants to redeem us from, so we can be a part of that kingdom. Again, speaking about this, he tells us, Luke 17 verse 20 to 21 we are told and when he was the man of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come he answered them and said the kingdom of God cometh not with observation neither shall they say lo here or lo there for behold the kingdom of God is within you so note that he says the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation it's not what you are seeing through your physical eyes it's through faith that's what the Lord wants us to focus on more than anything. It's allowing him to dwell in us so he can take his abode in us. But there's another power that's warring for this temple. And that is Satan. Satan also wants to dwell in us. This is the warfare that's going on. The same war that started off in heaven has simply just continued on this earth between the king of the north and the king of the south. And just as Christ wants to dwell in us through his spirit, so the Satan wants to dwell in us. And he does dwell in us automatically when we reject Christ and his principles. And we see that with Judas. You know what it says with Judas? It tells us in John 13, 27. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Frightening. So because Judas rejected it, what happened? Satan entered in and he became a temple for demons and many of us don't recognize it many of us think that we're on our own and that this this whole controversy doesn't involve us when it does if you're not with Christ you're automatically with Satan that's just how it goes you are guided by his principle which is self I I I we saw it in the beginning it's all about me that's the warfare and we spoke about this briefly in the previous presentation when we spoke about the literal temple. When Christ walked into that temple for the last time, he said, your house is left unto you desolate. And then when he left, what happened 40 years later? It was destroyed by the Romans, whom Satan was using at that time. The dragon power you'll find. Why? Because they rejected Christ. And it's not that Christ wants to destroy us, it's just that he has no choice because he is life. You know, you reject the one that gave you breath, you're automatically dead. That's just how it is. He created us. But many of us don't fail to realise it. But this is the warfare going on today for this temple. They're both fighting for the kingdom in this temple. Speaking about this warfare, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 7 verse 19, he says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So Paul in Romans 7 is describing his warfare, this war that's going on, which is what every true Christian will go through. The battle of the flesh against the battle of the spirit, the battle of the mind. So he wants to do good, but there is another power that's drawn in him to be evil, to do evil. He continues, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it. But sin that dwelleth in me. And who's the originator of sin? It's Satan. It's Satan that's working in him to do that. That's what I'm saying that if we don't give ourselves to Christ fully, you open up the way for Satan to dwell in you, in us. But sin that dwelleth in me, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members doing what warring this is the war i'm talking about that's going on, on this earth this is another law in his members warring against the law of my mind and bring me into captivity to the sin which is in my members so this is what he's describing this is a battle we all face even christ faced it 
the battle of the flesh against the battle of the spirit. How does Satan work? Through the lusts of the flesh, our selfish desires, for example, lying, stealing, I, 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 fornication, all about me, self-centeredness, trying to protect yourself, your rights, not caring about your neighbour, not caring about the principles that God has given us. It's just about self, about emotions, feeling, whereas the Lord works through principle, the principles of the Spirit, the principles manifested in his law, the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about the spiritual aspect of the law that Christ came to teach us, which is not based upon feeling, but based upon his word. It's all about the word, living by faith in his word and not by our feelings. But there's that warfare. And as I mentioned, Christ went through that himself. We saw that in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He didn't want to die on the cross. He prayed to the Father, if it's his will, take it away from him. He didn't want to die such a humiliating death. But he went through it for the sake of you and I. He went through it based upon the word of God and not by his feeling. And that's how we need to live, brethren. Because the climates of the war is approaching and if we don't have a faith in the word of God if we're not so imbued in the word of God we will fall and remain ever trapped in Satan so now is the time to recognize this because it's serious now as I mentioned that we are now in World War 3 in regard to this battle of this temple what do I mean by this well you'll find that Satan has split up the way he'll war against God into three phases. These phrases are firstly paganism you'll find, I'll describe it in a moment, which was open warfare against God which was seen through the heathen kings, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Egypt, Tyra, Assyria, they boldly rejected God. You know, Christ had the Levitical form of worship, the daily, which testified to Christ. Well, a lot of these heathen kings also had their daily, their pagan style of worship, the pantheon, where they used to sacrifice their own kids. And this is how they warred against God. This was the first war through the dragon. The second war, you'll find, was through the beast power. That is paganism under the garb of Christianity. You see that in the Roman Catholic Church. They claim to be Christians. They claim the name of Christ. But you see boldly that their rites, their worship style is infused with paganism. You see the elements of paganism, Babylon, in their worship style. That was the second war. And the third war now they are using is the false prophet. In other words, it's hard to see the distinguishing characteristics between Christ and Satan's kingdom because Satan is so mardy unto Christianity that it comes as a lamb, as described in Revelation 13. But later, as it speaks, it betrays his exterior and you find that it's none other than the power of Satan. And we are currently under this third war. I'd like to read a statement from the book called The Great Controversy, 1888 version, and she describes this so powerfully, confirming that we truly are under World War III on this earth. Now please, please listen carefully to this statement because it's powerful. She tells us, in the 12th chapter of Revelation, we have a symbol, a great red dragon. In the ninth verse of that chapter, this symbol is explained as follows. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the dragon represents Satan, the Bible is clear. And she describes how he was cast out, which we just read. He was cast out from heaven, from the northern kingdom, and cast down, where he became the prince of this world, the king of the south. Undoubtedly, the dragon primarily represents Satan. But Satan does not appear upon the earth in person. He works through agents. It was in the person of wicked men that he sought to destroy Jesus. As soon as he was born, wherever Satan has been able to control a government so fully that it would carry out his designs, that nation became, for the time, Satan's representative. This was the case with all the great heathen 
nations. For instance, see Ezekiel 28, where Satan is represented as actual king of Tyre. This was because he fully controlled that government. In the first centuries of the Christian era, Rome of all the pagan nations was Satan's chief attribute in a personal gospel and therefore represented by the dragon. So she's talking about this open warfare that was seen in the heathen king, in the heathen kings, including pagan Rome, and they boldly rejected Christ. They boldly had their pagan gods. This was the first open warfare clearly against Christ. And you could easily see the difference between the two. But a change came. Just as Christ changed his ministry where we no longer offer up sacrifice to daily, but we worshipped but they worshipped him in the heavenly temple, the holy temple at that time, Satan also changed his method of warfare. Now what he said, no, not what she said, this is all about the second warfare. We are told but there came a time when paganism in the Roman Empire fell before the advancing form of Christianity. Then as it is stated on page 54, paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power and his seat and great authority. That is, Satan then began to work through the papacy just as he had formerly worked through paganism. But the papacy is not represented by the dragon because it is necessary to introduce another symbol. Why another symbol? Because it's the second warfare, the second persecuting power the Lord wants us to understand. It's necessary to introduce another symbol in order to show the change in the form of opposition to God. Previously to the rise of the papacy, all opposition to the law of God had been in the form of paganism. God had been openly defied. But from that time, the opposition was carried on under the guise of professed allegiance to him. The papacy, however, was no less the instrument of Satan than was pagan Rome. For all the power, deceit and the great authority of the papacy were given it by the dragon. And so, although the Pope professes to be the vice garen of Christ, he is in reality the vice garen of Satan. He is Antichrist. So this is the second warfare and the power Satan was using, the temple he was occupying at that time, was Rome, papal Rome. So the papacy claims to be God's representative on earth when really he is Satan's representative because you see it through the acts he performed. You see how they killed and persecuted over 50 million families. Even today, you see how they're trying to join the other religions together. You see them saying this is not the only way to the father, there are other routes. So you see that this is not really a representative for Christ, but it is for Satan. But sadly, many are duped by it. This is the second warfare Satan was using to wage war against the saints. Now we'll talk about the third and final one. We are told, the beast which is a symbol of the papacy is introduced in Revelation 13 and following it in the same line of prophecy another beast is seen coming up Revelation 13 11, 14 which exercises all the power of the first beast for, before him that is in his sight this other beast must therefore be a persecuting power also and this is shown in that it spake as a dragon the papacy received all its power from Satan and the two horned beasts exercise the same power. It also becomes a direct agent of Satan and its satanic character is further shown in that it emphasises, it enforces the worship of the image of the beast by means of force. You can read all of that in Revelation 13. This is the lamb-like beast, the third power that Satan controls, his third method of warfare. In that it enforces the worship of the image of the beast by means of false miracles. He doeth great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and is even them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he hath done. So you see three persecuting powers. She then summarised, the first persecuting power is represented by the dragon itself. In heathenism there was open alliance with God an open defiance of God. In the second persecuting power, the dragon is masked, but the spirit of Satan actuates it. You see that through the papacy. The dragon supplies the motive power. 
in the first persecuting power all traces of the dragon are absent and a lamb like beast appears but when it speaks its dragon voice betrays the satanic power concealed under a fair exterior and shows to be of the same family as the two preceding powers in all the opposition to christ and his pure religion the old serpent called the devil and satan the god of this world is the moving power the god of this world the one who is king of the south this is his kingdom is the moving power earthly persecuting powers are simply instruments in his hand so these are the three modes of warfare that the christian is under through satan over the centuries that have passed and we are currently under the third and whom satan is using is the lamb like beast who claims to be christian and we see that in the evangelical world today in the pentecostal world today they talk about christ they talk about how they love christ they like to sing praises to god and talk about how they're in this loving relationship with christ but how do you know they're not of christ what does the lord tell us if you love me keep my commandments what do you what do these christians say when it comes to the law of god the law is not important it's done away with we'll be sinning until jesus comes it doesn't matter it's not important forget about the sabbath we are free we are under grace what does paul say do you make void the law through faith or through grace god forbid we establish the law that's why we are told in revelation chapter 12 verse 17 and the dragon this is satan the dragon through his earthly instruments was wrath with the woman that is the church and woman by prophecy represents a church see jeremiah 6 2 and went to make war with the remnant of her seed this is the final church which will what keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ that's how serious it is and i think that's why god separated the seven day adventist church by giving us the sabbath you know bringing it back into the forefront and making sure we kept it on the day he told us to keep it which was on the saturday sunset to sunset and satan hates this with a passion and that's why he is warring against those two christians who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus and when I say seven day Adventists, I'm not talking about nominal seven day Adventists, I'm talking about those who are seven day Adventists in heart through the spirit who seek to reform and to be like Christ and be obedient to all his law. Because there is a dangerous teaching that is entering our churches, which is coming from the dragon, from the fallen churches, the evangelicals. And that is, we will be sinning till Jesus Christ comes. And that is such folly because the Lord tells us in his word, in Philippians, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do what? All things. By saying that we cannot overcome sin is given power to Satan. It's saying that he's won. What is the point of Christ dying on the cross if we can't overcome sin and we'll just be sinning and, he, and we can't give him our sins? What's the point? It makes no sense. So I hope you see how serious this is and this is where this battle is leading upon all the earthly battles we are seeing with North Korea and whatever's going on. That's really not the focus. We, we become like the Pharisees who were so bent up and fixed on Rome. We need to be thinking more about the spiritual just as Christ was and that is who is residing in this temple. And it will be manifested, it will be proven that the one who's residing in the temple, if it's God, it will be shown because the person whom God is dwelling in will be like Christ. They will walk as Christ did. And as Christ kept all the commandments, so they would. In Christ there is no sin. That if Christ is in us, we will be obedient. And that's going to be the greatest witness to the world. That is the glory of God. That's what Christ wants to do with us so much. But we need to believe. And many of us don't believe it. And if we don't believe that we'll overcome sin, then of course we will be sinning because we have no faith. By saying you can't overcome sin, it's showing that you lack faith in God. You have no faith. So it makes no sense to me when people say that if you are trying to keep the commandments, if you're keeping the commandments, it shows you have no faith. It makes no sense. You know, to him that comes to God must believe. 
And it's not even us, it's Christ in us doing the work. That's the miracle of it. You know, if Christ is in us, Christ had no sin, it will be perfect, just as he was. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to make us like him. So why don't we let us, why don't we let him make us like him? Why don't we give ourselves to him? To this day, no matter where you are in your walk, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have done, God is willing to redeem us from the bondage, from the kingdom of Satan and translate us into his kingdom of light. He can do that for us right now, but we need to believe. And this is the war I want us to keep our minds focused on. Not so much the earthly, but the spiritual, for the kingdom of God cometh not with observation.